This is a this has been rather a unique day. Um, took a bit of a break from building cabin, which was was special in itself. So yeah, I built uh, my third piece of furniture here. So I got the uh, step back cabinet built. I got it all milk painted up here. We decided to oil the shelves just for a little contrast. But an interesting thing, if if one uh, visits flea markets, um, or so I should say antique stores, and looks at old um, early Canadian furniture, you'll find that almost 90% of it is built out of pine. Two reasons. Pine was readily available, and they had the tools to work it. It was a relatively soft wood. It was a pretty wood. Um, and so they're almost all made of pine. And if you're really lucky and you find a piece that has its original finish on, you'll notice if you, it has a drawer or a, a cabinet of some sort and you open it up, you'll notice that the inside has no finish on it. So pioneers were frugal, uh, not from desire, from, from necessity they had to be frugal. To show you how frugal they were, gun makers, I thought I'd use this as an example. Um, this uh, patch box here doesn't have any finish on the inside of it. So a little dovetail patch box I built into my musket there, but no finish. And behind the lock, after you've done all your intricate work to inlay the lock and the springs and everything, there's no finish in that because it didn't need it. So if it didn't need protecting and you couldn't see it, they weren't going to use their raw materials for it. The second really fascinating, not fascinating part, but a wonderful part of it today is we just took delivery of our Windsor back chairs. Now these are, um, these are authentic reproductions from um, the 1700s and uh, they come from a company down near Cornwall, Ontario and they're Johnson Antiques and Reproductions. And, and they make all kinds of reproduction 17th, 18th century furniture I should say 18th, 19th century furniture, um, except for chairs. The, the chairs are made in Quebec and they import them, they finish them. And so we got them in a distressed black and uh, darn if it isn't the most comfortable thing I've ever sat in. <laughs> in fact, <clears throat> I may not be doing a lot of building. I may just have to sit here a spell. A um, bit of history behind the Windsor chair. It was first built in Windsor, England. So hence the name. Um, sometime in the early, very early 1700s. And by about 1730s, it had made its way across the ocean to the colonies. Um, they figured that the first Windsor back chairs uh, in America were probably built in Philadelphia. Uh, but they took sort of a crude chair that, that uh, had come from England and they refined it into this elegant, uh, beautiful piece of furniture. And uh, yeah, if you see oil paintings of the founding fathers in the House of Burgess and whatever, they're all sitting in a chair almost identical to the one I'm sitting in. And like I said, the darn thing is <laughs> the most comfortable thing I've ever sat in. You can even sleep in this bed, boy. It's just perfect. Anyway, I'm, uh, I'm done for the day. Cabinet's done. Chairs are moved in. And uh, yeah, we had one heck of a storm go through. That was sort of neat. Lots of lightning, lots of hard rain. And good for the forest, good for the garden. Anyway, speaking of garden, I'm gonna have to go get something out of it for myself. finished yet another piece of furniture for the cabin. So I built myself here a three-legged stool and uh, there's an old Irish poem and I think it was a poem initially to turn it into a song and it goes something like, uh, have you ever been into an Irishman's shanty where money was scarce but the whiskey was plenty? A three-legged stool and a table to match and three eggs in the corner to ready to hatch. I think it's actually two eggs in the corner ready to hatch. But anyway, a three-legged stool is pretty phenomenal because no matter how many undulations you have in the floor, the thing's always going to sit flat. Perhaps not flat, but tight. It's not going to wobble on you compared to a four-legged chair like the one I'm sitting on. Anyway, I built this purposely at three feet long. This is going to be for um, cooking at the fire because we're going to spend a lot of time here at this open hearth fireplace. 
and the length sort of lends itself to uh, being able to sit at one end and put some of your foodstuffs at this end while you're preparing stews and such. So the interesting part about this um, piece of furniture is it started out a tree um, basically that big around. So the tree was roughly a foot, a foot in diameter. Actually, this came off a limb, I should say, off a very large walnut tree. So essentially what I did is I cut about a three inch slab off of it on about a 60 degree bias. And so, so I take this 12 inch tree and it turns into a three foot long bench. And uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's gonna go work quite well, quite well. And over here, we've got uh, what's going to be our countertop. And uh, it's got four legs, so it does wobble a bit. It's gonna need a few shims. But uh, this, uh, this is a workbench uh, circa 1830, came out of a shipbuilding yard. And it's gonna serve us very well for a countertop. I'm gonna build some small cabinets here, and maybe a few shelves behind me. And we'll utilize as much of the space in the cabin as possible. Busy day. So over here, I'm working on a new shooting bag. Uh, and this particular bag is going to be for a friend. I'm doing a bit of bartering with a fellow by the name of Nick Skinner. And he's a, he's an extremely good knife uh, blade maker from Nova Scotia, uh, Canada. And we're doing a little bartering. So he's, he shipped me off a blade, tells me it's in the mail. And I, I'm, I'm making him a shooting bag. So I'm making this out of brain tan deer hide that we did ourselves. Uh, on the inside flap, I've got a piece of coarse linen that I dyed with walnut. In this particular one, I've built in a little leather um, flint wallet. Um, the reason I did that is I, from experience. I've used to just throw my flints into my shooting bag, and one time I cut myself quite badly. So, yeah, it also keeps it organized, so that'll serve them well. Anyway, just to, just to review um, what a hunter in the 1700s would have carried in his shooting bag. Uh, I'll basically go through what I carry in mine. And everybody's a little different, but essentially they're pretty small bags and, and they seem like you're not gonna get a lot in there, but this small bag is sort of a native influence, obviously with the trade silver, but it, it has everything I need. So here's what a typical hunter would have carried, or at least I do. In this small bag, I've got some tow, um, scrapings from the linen floor. I use that for uh, cleaning the musket. I also sometimes use that to, for wadding if I'm using shot. So, item, I carry a small uh, priming horn that's got a finer powder for priming my flash pan. I carry a ball bag that's got, in the case of my smooth bore, we've got uh, 62 caliber lead, lead balls that we cast ourselves. carry a little flint wallet. So not only did you need the material in your shooting bag to shoot the gun, load and charge the barrel, but you also needed to maintain it. So I've got a, they didn't call them screwdrivers then, they were called turn screws. So I've got a turn screw. I've got my worm and a bullet puller. I've got a couple of spare flints. So that serves for maintaining the gun. For cleaning the gun, oh, I carry a little um, piece of coarse linen there that I use for um, uh, patching the ball. I carry a small tin of rendered down bear fat that I grease my patches with and I also use it to stop rust on the inside and outside of the barrel or metal parts of the gun. I have a cleaning, cleaning uh, rag. Oh, not for shooting the gun, but everybody carried a pipe. So we got the pipe in there. What else we got in there? Got a bullet mold for uh, casting lead balls. Getting down to it now, and that essentially that essentially covers. Um, and everybody's a little different. Everybody has different ideas of what to use. Um, so I got my round ball in that bag, but I carry a shot pouch for a shot, um, and of course my powder horn. And as long as I got the musket fine tuned, cleaned up, and I leave the door, I'm ready to go. Whether it's for defense or or for harvesting food, I'm I'm set to go. Anyway, back to the shooting bag. So, so for Nick Skinner, we're doing this little bit of barter there, and um, quite excited to see that new knife. 
Um, and uh, I, I hope he likes the bag because he didn't have a lot of influence on what I'm creating here. But the last step of this, because I'm essentially finished the bag, I, I did a gusset in the bottom to make a little uh, bigger space for a little more material in it. Um, and as I say, the flint wallet. So the last thing I'm doing is I'm um, making a strap. So I'm gonna move over to my ankle loom and show you how I make essentially historically accurate sashes. So the ankle loom is an 18th century, which is our persona. Uh, this style or model of sort of a lap ankle loom probably dates back about 100 years, roughly. The first ankle looms that, uh, that I've been able to research in terms of um, age-wise would be 1688 Scotland. And they were much larger, like a floor loom, but essentially they worked the same way. Um, you can buy these, they're readily available. Actually, I made this out of uh, three or four scraps of, of spare pine left over and, and some dowel. Um, I think the only thing I really bought other than dowel was a, was a, a carriage bolt that I used for my tensioner. So this is the tensioner and it'll take, it'll take the tension in and out. We're going to get that nice and tight for our weave. So it, uh, it looks rather complicated. But in fact, it's, it's, it's so simple, um, uh, it's painfully, painfully simple, but it works. So these, these white strands I've got are called heddles, and they're holding down the, the shorter of the wrap. So the whole thing's called the wrap. Um, so we've got the long wrap, which is all one color. It's the background color. In this case, it's all black. I'm doing a very simple design here, and the pattern part of the wrap has the colors I want to bring out in the pattern. So that is the shorter of the two. So in this case, um, the wrap goes on the, the inner part, or sorry, the heddles go on the inner part. And basically you're just pushing this down through to bring the background up, which will be all black. And I'll just turn the ankle loom here. And when you've done that weave, you're going to let that go. You're going to push this up and you're going to bring your finger down and that's going to bring out, um, it's going to bring out the brown part. I'll do that one more time. So we're going to push that guy down and you see we've got just the background, which is the same color, like the margins of the tape or the, the, the weave are, are the same color as what I've got on my um, um, wrapped here ready to go. So when I push, this up, you'll see the pattern colors come up. Take my finger, bring it down. And I've got on my tool here, I've got a very narrow side, a pointed side and a round side. So I'm doing my wrap for my weave on the, on the fatter side. I'm gonna use that pointed side and I'm gonna push that down nice and tight. And then I'm gonna take my shuttle Pull my shuttle through, I've got a fluff on here. Pull my shuttle through, and it takes, doesn't take a lot, a lot of practice to get pretty handy at this. I'm trying to get sort of an even consistency, right? So there I've done one, one portion of the pattern. So now I'm going to push this down, and I'm gonna bring my background up, which is gonna be all black. I'm gonna take my tool here, and we're gonna push that down nice and tight. My shuttle goes through, bring the next weave through, 